Thank you again for joining us today. Welcome back for another session on Grand Rounds Urology. Um, we are here today with Dr. Gerard Henry, who is uh, a private practice urologist with WK Advanced Urology in Shreveport, Louisiana. He's here today to tell us about some amazing new work that he has been doing uh, with penile implant infections and, and putting this in the context of understanding of the microbiome. And I am excited uh, to, to be joined by you today, Dr. Henry. And, um, Please let us know a little bit more about what you've been working on. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm here to discuss basically kind of the tr where we've moved with with penile implants. And I'm here to tell you that next gen sequencing is going to be taking over traditional cultures and what we can do with it to prove that it's more important. 20 years ago, penile implants in most of surgery we're still doing traditional cultures and we would only get positive cultures in about 50 to 70% of patients with gross pus on presentation. Now those, that, those had to be infected, but we weren't catching the bacteria, what it was that was causing these infections. And we also thought staph epidermidis was the number one cause of infections. That was actually an AUA board question for years was what was the number one bacteria that caused penile implant infections? Well, we think now it's wrong and we're gonna go over that with time. So about 20 years ago, Dr. Stephen Wilson and myself and a few others started culturing non-infected implants and we thought there was no bacteria. We thought we were being silly by culturing at the time of revision surgery for mechanical failure, and we found a lot of bacteria. We were finding almost higher rates of bacteria than we were on infected implants. So that didn't make sense. We published several papers on that. And one of the big papers that came out during that that changed clinical practice and is now part of the guidelines is washing out. Dr. Mulcahy came up with the salvage washout for infected implants, and then Dr. Wilson and myself and a few others, including Dr. Cully Carson and Craig Donatucci showed that in a multi-center study, two arms, the arm that you washed out clinically uninfected cases had lower infection rates than if you didn't wash it out. So now a guideline statement is wash out even in uninfected cases, cases to get rid of the biofilm. All right, move forward to about five years ago, we found that orthopedics was ahead of urology and biofilm, and they were using DNA sequencing. So they were showing that they were getting different bacteria and more bacteria than traditional cultures. So we started doing both traditional cultures and next-gen sequencing for both infected and uninfected cases. We now think, as we're gonna show a couple um, posters from meetings, we've won four clinical research best abstracts at national meetings with cash rewards. And of course we've had peer reviewed publications. So that should show you how much interest and excitement there is about this area. All right, so this is one of the posters that won best clinical um, research at a national meeting. And it's basically discussing in real fancy terms, next gen sequencing, and then looking at what biofilm, what bacteria is there. And we're thinking that this is the new gold standard. I won't go over the slides in detail, but basically the DNA sequencing is beneficial and it's a more thorough analysis of the biofilm and what bacteria that we're finding at the time of both uninfected and infected penile implant revisions. What's more important is one part is level one, that's quick, dirty, get you back PCR real quick, like for COVID-19 swabs. And then the second one is the more important one, I think, which is where they're doing the DNA testing. And that's where we're finding the real data. The other thing you need to know about next-gen sequencing is not only do you get more bacteria, but they give you an abundance rate. And this is where I think this is going to make the big difference is with abundance, you know what bacteria or isolate, because some of them are fungus, is actually causing the infection. 
So here we are, this is AUA at, um, National Meeting Abstract um, showing the next results. And you can see how much um, bacteria is uh, being found. So here we had 101 patients that had both traditional and the next gen sequencing. And let me tell you, next gen sequencing was more beneficial in terms of finding what isolates are there. It also gives us more sensitivity resistance and we're um, finding out abundance, which is what bacteria is causing the problems. And it's not staph epi, it is gram negatives. And we just published a paper in the journal of Sexual Medicine that went over all this data. So what do we do? Here we have a whole bunch of new data. And what do we do with it? This has never been done before in prosthetic urology. We're actually having a prospective randomized study comparing traditional cultures versus the next gen sequencing data. So a patient shows up to your practice and they look like they have a clinically low grade infection and you do a traditional culture and you do next gen sequencing and we randomize how you treat them. All right, we already have had central IRB approval. We're planning on 19 total sites and we'd be happy to have more. Any listeners out there who are, would like to be enrolled. Three academic centers have already independently approved the protocol, including Jefferson, Duke University and Northwestern University, some real ivory tower places. And we've already enrolled our first patient. Um, and so we're just getting started. I think only about five or six total places have been approved so far, but um, we're looking to have more. So this is exciting. We're gonna directly compare outcomes of traditional culture versus next-gen sequencing and hopefully showing better patient care. That's wonderful. Can I ask a couple questions about the upcoming trial? Yes, ma'am. So when you're talking about comparing outcomes, is this going to be at, uh, at the time of explant giving antibiotics that are appropriately tailored or okay. is this, Great yeah, tell, question. tell me a little bit about the outcomes. Right. Okay. So the patient, you know, some patients present in their toxic, you know, fever, elevated white count, cottage cheese looking stuff coming out of their incision, those you just got to take out and be done with. What we're talking about is kind of the patient who shows up with um, serosanguinous drainage, uh, you know, could be a little bit yellowish, but, you know, or afebrile, normal white count, non-toxic, and we've been trying to salvage them with antibiotics. So, you know, some doctors will say, if in doubt, take it out. Well, that was 20 years ago thinking that the new wave is, you know, maybe we can save some of these, you know, the traditional term is salvage them. So um, we're going to, one arm is going to be culture. Everybody's going to get both traditional culture and the NGS randomized to one or the other arm. And then if you get the traditional culture, you just do your normal pathway, your local standard of care. If you get randomized to next-gen sequencing, we'll get more data in an IR, I mean, an infectious disease doctor will make the decision on which antibiotics or antifungals that you're put on. So it's, I think it's going to show the outcomes is you're going to be able to save more of these implants, i.e. salvage them on antibiotics without having to go to surgery. So the outcome is, the big number one outcome is how many implants are you saving traditional culture versus next-gen sequencing. And we have some secondary endpoints. Like one of the things that orthopedics is doing much better than us is they have a, a systematic approach to patients who present to clinic, you know, tenderness, erythema, warmth, fever, low I count, um, drainage, the quality of the drainage. And currently in urology, we don't have anything like that. So they have their, I'll call them stages of clinical presentation for implants. And that's a secondary endpoint is trying to uh, kind of classify or stage clinical presentation. That's great. Now, I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself as you're going through all of these that there are so many other 
you know, other opportunities within the field of urology to kind of apply a similar set of criteria. For example, um, you know, for, for my specialty in uh, urogynecology, we have our sacral nerve modulation implants, which, you know, mm -hmm. the two big complications there are breakage, which obviously that probably yeah. doesn't have anything to do with this, but infection being the other one, and you get the same kind of, you know, low level pain over the generator or something like that, where you're not entirely sure and you can try to salvage it with antibiotics, but we haven't had a tremendous amount of luck doing that either. And so, you know, the taking the, the example from orthopedics of some kind of systematic approach to can we salvage this without an explant, uh, I think is a, is a wonderful wonderful way to start and may have incredible repercussions throughout um, other other fields and other other you know devices that we use throughout um, throughout urology I think uh, you know this is really this is really an amazing find I'm really interested as well to hear the pattern of bacteria being so different than what we expected or what we've as you said as have classically been taught is there any thought about where some of this, some of this might be coming from. I mean, that if I looked at your graph correctly, it looked like E. coli was one of the most common uh, colonizing bacteria in these biofilms. Is there concern about a source within the urinary tract for those, or that any ideas about where that might be coming from? Or whether it would be, it would be a great question, pure speculation. Um, and I, I do do a few interstem, and I enjoy them because patients get great results. But the uh, and they're very pleasant to do. Um, but as far as what's we're finding out, gram negatives, as you said, E. coli and Pseudomonas are the two biggest. And so you know we were always taught that you know E. coli and Pseudomonas in a patient is a bad infection. Yeah. And that Staph epi is a wimpy skin organism. Well, the next gen sequencing is proving that that really Staph epi. So like we will get Staph different types of staff in the next gen sequencing as one of the five to nine microbes that are there. But the abundance data, you know, 95% of the bacteria there is E. coli or pseudomonas. And I, I don't understand it. Maybe uh, skin um, staff grows better on sheep's blood than <laughs> gram negatives. I mean, that's, I guess that's what's going on. And uh, what's really exciting is everybody who presents with infection is positive. So, you know, the traditional where 30 to 50% is culture negative, well, they're all positive. We, we know there's bacteria there. Right. We just couldn't culture it. Um, maybe the antibiotics were killing it before we could culture it or whatnot. But yeah, yeah we're finding out that gram negatives and where they're coming from, urine tract, colon tract, I'm, I'm yeah. not real sure. Yeah, so. no, I think there's there's a lot still to be learned. It's it is really interesting that um, you know there was some evidence that the that sometimes these bacteria that exist in biofilms can be in a quiet sort of a quiescent state mm -hmm. where they're not you know actively expanding, and so maybe that's one of the reasons the culture data has been sort of out of sync with with the the findings. You know, you you have Frank pus coming out of a wound. You think you should be able to culture something. It also makes me sort of wonder whether we should be applying next generation sequencing to to other types of wounds. You know, there's been plenty of um, plenty of times I've cultured what looks like a, a, a draining wound and not gotten anything out of it, and starting to make you wonder whether some of these these factors are at play as well in other situations. Well, well, I will say it's already um, the gold standard for um, what uh, what we'll call kind of chronic wounds, like chronic open wounds that wound care is doing next gen sequencing is the gold standard there. So I think it will become the gold standard for uh, urology. You know, kind of one of the other exciting areas is just urinary tract infections and, you know, low grade, low amounts, whatnot. And, um, and you may not know this, I've, I've only heard this, but according to Medicare data, the number one use of culture by far, like three times higher than the next one is urinary tract infections. So it's, it's uh, urologists and urinary tract infections are doing the most culturing by far. Yeah, so it sounds like we need to have a better, a better uh, awareness and understanding of how to use this in all of our conditions as well. 
Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing this exciting data with us and good luck with the upcoming trial. I hope we'll get you back for an update when we've got some results from that. Uh, and it was a pleasure to have you with us today.